Hello, this is Professor George Easton, and this video is part two of my introduction to our notebooks. In the part one video, I provided some useful background, especially with respect to the concept of literate programming and also the idea of markdown language. In this video, I'm going to show you how to create our notebooks and what the uh, basic syntax is for both formatting text in our notebooks and also for including our code. Before we begin, I just wanted to give you a very quick reminder that this video has a homepage at datasciencesource.com. The link is shown on the slide here, and both the part one video and this video are embedded there. In addition, you're going to find links to source code and data used in the video. And finally, I wanted to remind you that our notebooks are constructed with three types of sections. In the very beginning is a configuration header written in YAML. And what YAML does is basically assigns options and parameters that will control the software that automatically generates the document. And this is done by assigning values and key value pairs. The next kind of section are text sections or chunks and these are written in R Markdown. And the last kind of section are code sections or code chunks. And for us, these are going to be written in R. To create an R notebook, you're going to want to run R Studio, which I have done. And I'm going to assume in this video that you have had experience using R Studio and R. To create an R notebook, Go to the File menu and then do New File and select R Notebook. And in the Editor pane, a sort of template R Notebook is going to appear. This template notebook that has been created has not yet been saved and doesn't have a name. So the first thing I'm going to go ahead and do is save the notebook. So I'll do File, Save As, and then navigate to the folder where I want to put the notebook and then give it a name, and then I can just go ahead and save the file. And the next thing I may want to do is to change the working directory of R to the location of this notebook. I can do that in the session menu by clicking on Set Working Directory and choose to the source file location. So the R notebook here is a complete R notebook, so I can think about previewing what it's going to look like when it's in its manuscript form, I'll call it, its processed form. And I can do that by clicking on the preview button here. And what I get is a preview of what the notebook will look like when it's been formatted. Now I'm going to change one option here because while doing this demo, I really don't want the preview to pop up in a page that is going to be blocking what I'm doing. So I'm going to go ahead and kill this preview and then go to settings and check the box here that says preview in the viewer pane. And what this means is that when I preview the document, it's going to appear over here on the right hand side in this viewer pane. So next I'm going to go ahead and make the code editor window large. And then I'm just going to get rid of all of the text in here that is below this little header section which I'll talk about in just a second and we'll start our demonstration of our notebooks. So this little header here is the YAML header that I was talking about previously. And what this particular header is doing is providing a title to the notebook and telling the processing software that the output should be a notebook as an HTML web page. So I'm going to go ahead and leave the output the way it is, but I'm going to change the title of the notebook to R Notebooks Basics. So if we go ahead and preview the file, what you're going to see is that the output document only has the title of the notebook. In addition to the output type of HTML notebook, a variety of other output types are available as well, such as Word documents and PDF documents. But I will return to what those various types are towards the end of this video. Now, as discussed earlier, the remainder of the notebook is going to consist of sections of text and sections of code. So I'm going to begin with the 
first section of text and start to enter text. So I've entered a line of text here and again if I click the preview button what I'm going to see is that that text now appears in the preview on the right hand side. So I'm now going to go through the most basic formatting commands in our notebooks so that at the end of this tutorial you should be able to construct some useful documents. The very first thing we're going to talk about are sections. Section headers are entered using the pound sign. So I've just created a section header called sections and subsections and followed it by a little text that says, of course many documents are organized into sections and subsections. Sections and subsections are made with the following syntax. So let's quickly look at the preview here. And you'll see that the header has come out followed by the text. So here is the hierarchy of sections, subsections, and subsubsections. Section heads are specified with a single pound. Subsections are specified by using two pounds. Subsubsections by three, and so on. And I believe this goes down to a total of six levels. So again, let's take a quick preview of our document and see what it looks like. So there are the section, subsection, and subsubsection headers. Now before going into more details about the formatting of the text portions of the R notebook, I want to show you a code section right away. Code sections are indicated and in a sense delimited by three back ticks. The next thing you need in a code section is the syntax that tells R notebooks what programming language to use to run the code section. And that's done with an open curly bracket and then the letter R for R in this particular case and then a closed curly bracket and that's all that's necessary. So in my code section here I'm going to store into a variable X 500 standard normal random numbers and then I'm going to make a histogram of these normal random numbers. And finally I'm going to close the code chunk here with three more back ticks. If you're having trouble finding the back tick on your keyboard, it's usually on the upper left hand side on the same key that the tilde is on, which is just left of the number one. So I now have a code chunk here, and you'll notice that as I've closed this, I get some controls along here on the right hand side. The little green play button here will run this code, so let me go ahead and do that. And what you'll see is that the histogram has been placed into the document that I'm editing. If I now click preview, you'll see that both the code chunk and the results of the computation of the code chunk, which is the histogram, are now placed into the preview of the final document. Now this second icon here that's kind of a down arrow and a dash will run all of the previous code in the file up to just before this code section. So if the code you're running in a code section depends on calculations done earlier, you can press that button in order to run all of the previous code. Once the output of the code has appeared, which in this case was the histogram, you'll also see that there are icons here on the upper right that will allow you to close this histogram. So I'm going to clean up my file a little bit here by putting in a section head in front of the code block and a sentence that explains what the code block is doing. So it says code example, generate 500 standard normal random numbers and make a histogram. You can also put computed values directly into the text. So here is an example. To generate a normal random number and to put it in the text, I use a back tick and I use the letter R to indicate the language that I'm going to be using, and then the R command. So I'm just generating a standard normal random number, just one of them. And now if I click the preview to produce the formatted document, and then scroll down here, you'll see that the text is now there, but also the value computed by the R code. If you want to show the R code formatted as code, you can also use the back ticks. Just leave out the letter R in the very beginning that tells our notebooks to actually run this as code. So again I'm going to go ahead and run the preview. You'll see that we now have the R code that we use to generate this normal random number displayed. 
I'm now going to return to talking about the basic formatting of text. To create unnumbered lists, you use the star or the asterisk. So if I run the preview again, what you'll see is that I now have an unnumbered list at the very bottom that shows the list items, items 1, 2, and 3. To get sub-items in your list, you need to use indentation. So the key here is to have four spaces, or perhaps more, but it works when you press the tab key in RStudio twice. So let me go ahead and preview this list with sub-items. So there it is. You can see the sub-items over here on the right. And you can do sub-sub-items in a more or less similar fashion. So there's another indent here that required pressing the tab key twice and then another symbol to indicate the bullets. So let's go ahead and preview this. So here we have items, sub-items, and then sub-sub-items. To get numbered lists, you use the following similar kind of syntax. So you're going to just use numbers to indicate the numbers, but the indentation will indicate the sub-items and the sub-sub-items, and our notebooks can number with both numbers, but also with the letters A, B, and C, and the Roman numerals I, 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 and so on. So let me go ahead and preview this and show you what that looks like. So here are our numbered lists, with the major items being numbered 1, 2, 3, the sub-items A and B, and then the sub-sub-items starting with the Roman numeral I. Next, I'm going to show you how to enter hyperlinks into our notebooks. And in doing so, I'm going to give you links to good documentation for our notebooks and our markdown. Documentation for our markdown can be found at this following link, but let's look at the syntax for creating the link. You start the link with a pair of square brackets, and the text that will be displayed for the link is what goes inside of those square brackets. So this link will appear as our markdown docs. To actually specify the URL, you open a round parentheses, a regular parentheses, and then you put in the URL. So this is at http colon double slash rmarkdown.rstudio.com slash lesson one and so on. So that is the way that you specify hyperlinks in R. So I'm going to go ahead and preview this and show you the result. So there is the section header, R Markdown Documentation and Hyperlinks and below it is the text line containing the link. And if we click that link, we should get that page opened in whatever our default browser is. So now I'm going to go ahead and return to our studio and provide another couple of links. There is a very good cheat sheet for our markdown at the following link, and I strongly recommend that you take a look at this and probably print it out. And there's also a reference guide as a PDF file at the link that I just entered into the R notebook. So let me go ahead and preview these. And you should have seen not only how to format links in R notebooks, but you now also have links to R Markdown documentation, a terrific cheat sheet, and a guide as a PDF file. So next I want to tell you about paragraphs, bold, and italics. So I just created a section for this and have put into that section one sentence that says paragraphs are indicated by two spaces or new lines at the end of a line. And that is the case, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. But if I take a text string like this two spaces and I surround it on either side by two stars or asterisks, it's going to be formatted as bold. In a similar fashion, if I take a text string and surround it by single stars, it's going to be formatted as italics. And let me show you the preview for that. So here's our section for paragraph bold and italics. And sure enough, the string two spaces is printed in bold, and the single word end is printed in italics. Moving back to the issue of how you indicate a paragraph in our notebooks, 
I'm going to paste in a bunch of text. So all of this text now will more than fill up a line and is enough text to really create paragraphs. And all the text that's in the first paragraph I've indicated by just saying paragraph 1 over and over again and in the second paragraph, paragraph 2. Well, you'll notice here I have in these parentheses two spaces follow and if I select the end of this line you'll see that that is in fact the case. There's one, I just backspaced out one and then backspaced out the second one and now I'll put them back in. And now if I preview this text what you're going to see is that those two spaces at the end of that line at the end of the first paragraph did in fact cause a paragraph break. Next I'm going to show you how to use two new lines for a paragraph. And to do this I'm going to go ahead and put paragraph 2 on the clipboard. So I'm doing control X to cut it so that when I do control C to copy it it'll be just like I'm typing it out. And now I'm going to go ahead to the end of the last line of paragraph 1 and remove the two spaces. Now I'll put in the two new lines. There's the first one, here's the second one, and now when I paste the paragraph 2 text it's going to come out here on the same line where the cursor currently is. So I'm going to go ahead and paste it. So I only have one blank line between paragraph 1 and paragraph 2. And now when I go ahead and preview this you'll see I also get a paragraph break but this time I get the break with a blank line in between. The next thing I want to tell you about in this basic introduction to our notebooks is how to add options to your code chunks that will control whether or not the code is printed or the results of the code is printed. So I just repeated the code chunk that I used above where I'm generating 500 standard normal random numbers and then creating a histogram. But this time I've modified the syntax that was used to indicate that R should be used to run this code to add two options. So you do that by putting a comma after the R and then you put your options as the option name which is going to be echo and I have it set to false. And then the second option I have here has to do with evaluation and I have set that to true. Now if I run this code block what you'll see is the histogram appears in the source or editor pane here just like it did before and if I run the preview what you'll see is that the code is not printed out as before. That's because I set the echo option to false but I left the eval option as true so the histogram appears. If I wanted to just show the code and not show the histogram, I could change echo to true and eval to false and then rerun this, so I'll redo the preview, is that the code does in fact show, but the histogram doesn't. And of course if I want to show both, which is oftentimes the case, I'm going to put echo equals true and eval equals true and now when I run the preview you'll see at the bottom here that I not only get the code printed out but I also get the histogram. So I have one final thing to show you in this very basic introduction to our notebooks and that is if you go to the folder where the code file has been saved which for us is the basic R notebooks.rmd when you have clicked the preview button an HTML file has been created which is what is being previewed and if you click on that you'll see the R notebook in your browser so this is the notebook that we have been looking at so this concludes my basic introduction to R notebooks returning to R studio now I'm going to show you another R notebook which provides a more complete and substantive example and will also give you some idea of how to put mathematical notation into the code chunks of the R notebook. So now I'm going to open a new file that you have access to called generating bivariate normal random variables.rmd. So 
it is R Markdown and it's another R notebook. This notebook is a substantive example that explains how to generate bivariate normal random variables. And the topic that I describe here may be quite useful to you, but I'm really doing it now just to show you how mathematics can be put into our notebooks. So this R notebook starts in the same way. There's the YAML preamble here, and I've created this title, How to Generate Bivariate Normal Random Variables Using the Regression Line. And then I create a section called First the Math, and it starts with the sentence, in simple linear regression, we assume the following model. Now I can put an equation in here using a language called LaTeX by putting double dollar signs and then specifying my equation. And you can see in the LaTeX format of these equations, the Greek letters are specified by using backslash alpha for alpha, backslash beta, and so on. When you do this, R Notebooks gives you a preview of the equation in the R Notebook code. It does not do this for inline equations, and you can see I've used a single dollar here to say that, that the error terms epsilon are distributed as normal random variables with a mean zero and a standard deviation of sigma sub epsilon. And let's go ahead and create the preview and take a look. To create the preview, I'm first going to run all of the code. So I'm going to click on the Run button up here and then slide all the way down and do Run All. So everything has now run. If I don't do this, this file throws an error for reasons which I'm not entirely clear about. So now let's go ahead and create the preview and take a look. So to create the preview, first run all of the code in the file. So I'm going to click over here where it says Run, and then select the last menu item that says Run All. If I don't do this, when I click Preview, an error occurs, and I'm not sure exactly why. But if I run all the code first and then generate the preview, it works just fine. So now I'm going to go ahead and click on the Preview button. And what you'll see here is that all of this mathematics is very nicely formatted. For example, here is the regression line, and then down the inline, and then the inline equation that we were talking about is right here, and it says the error term epsilon is distributed as a normal random variable with mean zero and standard deviation sigma sub epsilon. In this file, I've demonstrated quite a lot of math formatting. For example, I have aligned equations here, and many of you will be able to figure out what you need to do with simple equations just by looking through this file. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the pieces here, but ultimately what we do in this file is specify the desired correlation we want between the normal random variables and the standard deviation of each of those variables, and then generate that random data. So I'll let you go ahead and take a look at this as well. And I'm going to provide now at the very top of this file a link to a tutorial on math in LaTeX. So let me go ahead and add that to the file. And that may help you understand exactly what is going on if you're interested in it. So I'll generate the preview one more time. And you'll see that at the very beginning, you now have a link to a LaTeX math tutorial. So this concludes my introduction to literate programming and R notebooks. With what I've taught you, you should be able to, at the very least, make basic R notebooks, but with a little effort, go beyond the basics and really make some R notebooks that look really very nice.